On their return from the Pacific Ocean in 1806, Lewis and Clark separated for their travels through what is now Montana. William Clark took the southerly route, and on July 7, he and his party hastened across the Big Hole Valley toward a gap in the mountains to the southeast. Another valley, less extensive and more rugged, opened itself to our view as we passed through the gap. But as we had made 25 miles and the night was advancing, we halted near some handsome springs, which fall into Willard's Creek. Naming the creek for Alexander Willard, the company blacksmith, Clark then led his men eight miles downstream until the creek entered the mountains. There, they turned southward. After one brief visit from the explorers, Willard's Creek would continue in solitude for another 50 years. Old Snag, a petty chief of the Snakes and Bannocks, marked out on a piece of paper the locality where gold could be found, which, comparing in December following, found to correspond exactly with the situation of Bannock City. Ed Purple, a storekeeper with six wagon loads of goods and no store to sell them in, ignored the advice of Snag. It was John White that stopped to camp on the creek in July 1862. As usual, White took a few minutes on the gravel bar with his pan in hopes of striking color. He was on his way with friends to meet another group of prospectors, but White and his friends would never reach their destination. Willard's Creek was the big strike that every prospector dreamed of. That John White discovered the gold on Grasshopper, there's no doubt. But the first man to pan out one dollar was Charlie Reveille. He used the lid of a camp kettle for his pan. William Still was also a character in this party. Still was a nickname given him because he was so quiet. This name hung to him so well that deeds were made out to him in that way. John White renamed Willard's Creek Grasshopper because of the hordes of insects that plagued he and his partners. When a man whose name happened to be Willard protested saying the creek should remain Willard's Creek, he was ignored. It's said he was so obnoxious in his arguments that he practically guaranteed that the name would be changed. Grasshopper Creek was the first major strike on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. The town of Bannock City, a misspelling of the native nation that lived nearby, sprouted along the north bank. Within two months, 500 miners had flocked to the grasshopper diggings. I saw several times the miners pull up the small sagebrush that grew on the edge of the bars and shaking off the sand and fine gravel that adhered to the roots into the pan, which they carried to the creek and obtained from 25 cents to one dollar to the pan in small pieces of beautiful gold. This caused the saying at Bannock that we could pan gold out of the sagebrush. Reports of the newest gold strike spread like a grass fire. Americans ravaged by the Civil War came by the thousands from the east in search of new lives. They traveled the long, dusty Oregon Trail across the plains, reaching the Army post at Fort Laramie, then on to Fort Bridger, a trading post and blacksmith shop founded in 1843 by famed mountain man Jim Bridger. There they started hearing fabulous stories of riches to be found in the north. Despite the discouraging reports from humbugged miners returning along the road, many pilgrims changed their plans. At Fort Hall, they crossed the Snake River on Rickards Ferry, left the Oregon Trail, and crossed the Dusty Base into the north. They crossed the Bitter Roots and on to Bannock. I reached this mining camp yesterday. It is located on Grasshopper Creek. I do not think there are over 300 people in camp. It is not much of a place. It looks now as if it were a wild goose chase to come to this country. A person ought to make money pretty fast here to pay them for living in such a place. It was afternoon before we at last halted on Salt Lake Hill and looked down upon the little settlement along the banks of the grasshopper. The view was not an inspiring one. Still, miners continued to flood the grasshopper diggings. 
They came from the faded boom of Pikes Peak. They fled Fraser River's flash of excitement from Fort Colville and from California. The small settlement of Gold Creek, the first mining camp in what is now Montana, emptied overnight. And over the Bitterroot Mountains from the west came the rush from played out gold camps like Pierce, Orofino, Elk City, and Florence. It required no more than one man with an imaginative mind to start half the population off on a wild goose chase. Somebody would say that somebody said that somebody had found a good thing. And without further inquiry, a hundred or more men would start out for the reported diggings. Another way gold seekers got into the territory was by steamboat from St. Louis. $100 bought deck passage, and two months on the Missouri River got them to Fort Benton, an isolated fur company trading post and impromptu town. The year that John White discovered gold at Bannock, just four steamers arrived at Fort Benton. Over the next seven years, 119 more would bring hordes of would-be millionaires. Aboard the steamship Shreveport, Wednesday, June 11, 1862. Started at 3 a.m., got aground in a few minutes, landed and had to sound until 7 o'clock to find a channel. About the middle of the afternoon, I saw a fine buffalo bull about 300 yards from the bank, so I took my first shot since coming on the boat at a buffalo, the ball going through the lungs. He ran nearly 200 yards before falling. When news of gold in the Rocky Mountains reached President Abraham Lincoln, he personally mustered James Liberty Fisk out of the Union Army. Fisk was put in charge of leading annual wagon trains from his home in Minnesota across the Dakota Territory and to the gold mines. Lincoln wanted the new territory to be settled by northern anti-slavery pioneers, and he also wanted all that newfound gold to find its way into northern banks to pay for an army that would preserve the Union. Reaching the growing town of Bannock, the first train of immigrants did not wish to build their new homes amidst the noise of saloons and a growing majority of Confederate sympathizers. Instead, they crossed Grasshopper Creek to the South Bank. Their new settlement became known as Yankee Flat. I think the town is very quiet and orderly for such a mining town, much more so than I expected to find it. Directly across the street was a saloon, an orderly place for a saloon and a mining camp. For there was not much quarreling, nor any fighting, nor any foul language as far as I can remember, except for the usual profanity, and it was usually closed by midnight. Balls and dancing parties were held two and three times a week, while a dancing school was open every night except Sunday, under the supervision of Buzz Caven and his partner Lou Smith. These parties were pleasant and agreeable, and patronized as they were by all the ladies, married and single done more to cultivate a spirit of goodwill and friendly feeling among the citizens than all other means combined. When evening fell, if it were Saturday and payday, a long line of short, sturdy men might be seen entering the beer hall opposite us, owned by Mr. French, an Englishman. His customers were his fellow countrymen from Cornwall. Soon from across the street, music was heard, and our door stood wide open to admit it, for my mother, herself a singer, loved it. John Thompson and Jeff Blevin set out from Eugene, Oregon with a wagon load of cats. Their cage was capsized in the Lemmy Pass, at a great loss of cats, and the packers and the teamsters passing that way for a long time told wild stories of weird Indian cries at night in that region. But a woman went out one day with her children, and quite a string of cats followed her home. And the strange weird screams were heard no more. Thompson and Blevins told me that they sold their cats as fast as they could hand them out, at from $10 to $75 each. There was the express office of A.J. Oliver & Company, 
a butcher shop, and the general merchandise store of Swift and Thompson. The remainder of the street was given over mainly to saloons and dance halls. While respectable women were treated with the utmost consideration by all sober men, there was too much drinking for women to care to be on the street unaccompanied. The rich diggings of Grasshopper Creek attracted many undesirable characters. And I believe there were more desperados and lawless characters in Bannock, the winter of 1862 to 1863, than ever infested any other mining camp of its size. Murders, robberies, and shooting scrapes were of frequent occurrence. It's not safe now for men to travel alone if they have much money with them. There are too many highway robbers. At the head of a dry gulch between Bannock and Horse Prairie, I discovered the remains of burned clothing, the jaws of a carpet sack, buttons, and other debris, which convinced me that a murder had been committed near that place. Arriving at Sun River, some of our party found a man who had been murdered and thrown into the stream. The body was naked, lying in a deep, clear pool of water. Dan McFadden, <laughs> known as Bummer Dan. He was a character in the camp. He was a simple fella, rather lazy. He got his name from the habit of bumming things, especially meals. He was not considered much of a miner and was looked on with more or less pity. The miners grew tired of Bummer Dan's constant begging. They gave him a barren claim which he worked and to everyone's surprise, he struck a rich vein. But with gold dust blowing through the streets and no organized law to protect the welfare of citizens, robberies became more brazen. It was well known that Bummer Dan was carrying $2,000 in gold to Salt Lake City on the Peabody and Caldwell stagecoach. Just outside Bannock, masked gunmen stopped the stage, and Bummer Dan McFadden was relieved of all his earnings. Henry Plummer arrived in Bannock in November of 1862. A man of charming personality and softness of speech, he was always the best dresser in town. Plummer was soon well liked. He had been in the California Gold Rush where he worked as a baker and then later as Deputy Marshal of Nevada City. Henry Plummer was a man of wonderful executive ability. He was well educated, his eyes were mild and expressive. In demeanor, he was quiet and modest, free from swagger and bluster, dignified and graceful. He was intelligent and brilliant in conversation, a good judge of men, and his manners were those of a polished gentleman. Despite his personal appeal and record of public service, Plummer also had a checkered past. Numerous barroom scrapes haunted him, as well as shooting a man dead while wearing the badge. At least five men were dead by his hand, all he claimed in self-defense. It is charitable to believe that Henry Plummer came to Bannock intending to reform and live an honest and useful life. If he could have been relieved of the fear of exposure and of the necessity of associating with his old comrades in crime, it is not improbable that his better nature would have triumphed. Plummer brought to Bannock his charismatic personality, an expertise in judging mining prospects, and the quickest gun in the Northern Rockies. He could empty his Navy Colt revolver in three seconds with deadly accuracy. In the spring of 1863, he was elected sheriff of Bannock. He quickly became one of the most controversial and legendized personalities of the American West. Today has been a day of melancholy in town. There has been one of our most respectable and peaceful citizens shot. Yes, shot like a dog by a villain whom no man respecteth, but looketh upon him as a fiend. 
Sheriff Henry Plummer arrested the young murderer, Peter Horan, and led him to his office in George Chrisman's store. I saw the greatest courage and the most promptitude in a man that I ever saw. The rabble entered the courthouse and wanted the prisoner, but the sheriff told them that the first man that laid hands on him, either friend or foe, would be a dead man. Plummer had a gallows built by Sanford Ruffner to hang Horan, but despite Plummer's popularity, a steady growth in crime distressed the early Bannock residents. A suspicion grew that Henry Plummer, as sheriff, was actually at the heart of an organized ring of thieves. Whoever lives to see the gang of highwaymen now infesting the country broken up will find that Henry Plummer is at the head of it. I was approached by Mr. Wiles, a citizen of Bannock, stating that he desired me to join the vigilantes. I at first declined to join until I had some further explanation of the matter, and he left me, but returned in half an hour and handed me a double barrel shotgun, requesting me to join them in arresting Plummer, Stinson, and Ray. As soon as I knew it was for that purpose, I at once assented. It was bitterly cold that year during the holidays, and there was a general feeling that something tragic was about to happen. Some of this time was spent in planning to take Plummer and his associates with the least loss of life by his captors. This did not tend to promote a Christmas spirit. When they came to get Plummer, the leader, a well-known citizen, knocked and Mrs. Vale answered. They asked for Plummer. When he came to the door, the leader threw his arms around him. Not feeling well, he had taken off his belt containing his pistol and heavy knife and laid them beside him on a chair. A most unusual thing for him to do, he always went around armed, even in the house. The vigilantes led Henry Plummer and his two deputies up Hangman's Gulch to the gallows that Plummer, just four months before, had arranged to be built for the hanging of Peter Horan. Plummer became awfully alarmed and was walking around inside the circle formed by the vigilantes, begging those among them whom he knew to help him and imploring them to let him off, promising that if they did so, he would leave the country. The rope was placed around his neck and the wretched plumber was slowly raised and strangled to death. McMurtry and I went up the gulch to see them about 11 o'clock. There was no one there, but as we came back we met the crowd coming. It has always been a wonder to me how McMurtry got the news so early. He came in my place and then told me that Plummer, Stinson, and Ray were hanging up the gulch. I would not believe it until I saw for myself, and he accompanied me, said it was not safe for me to go alone. Monday morning, January 11th, broke clear, bright, and cold. The cold was intense. Not a breath stirred the crisp air. Before sunrise, word came to Marysville and flew down the grasshopper for miles to all the miners that the main trio of road agents had been hung on the previous night. Dressed in my heaviest wraps and mitts, and stopping in at several miners' cabins to warm, I ran all the way to town. The street was filled with armed men. Many were drinking in the numerous saloons that lined the only street, and an air of satisfaction and relief prevailed. Bannock is known really for its violence. The execution of the sheriff and the deputies is a major, you know, Wild West story here. But the day after the hanging of the sheriff on January 11th, 1864, Vigilantes when, then went after a man named John Wagner, and after hanging John from the interior of a building, they went after a man named Joe Pizanthia. One of the things I never understood about this is, out of all the men they hanged, Joe apparently was the only man that fought back. And as Joe fought back, Vigilantes tried to get into his home. He shot two of them, killing one. So the Vigilantes actually took a a break. They went to visit the Chief Justice of Idaho, who happened to have a cannon left to him by a wagon train from Minnesota. Well, they borrowed that cannon, they came back and they blew up Joe's house. Joe was injured, they pulled him out. 
a man named Smith Ball kills him right then and there. But they weren't done with poor Joe at that point. Then they went on to hang Joe after he was killed. Then they said a frenzy ensued and he was shot at least a hundred times. Finally, they end Joe and they have to decide what to do with him. The Chief Justice of Idaho's wife, Mary Edgerton, said they weren't quite sure what to do with Joe. Should they just take him out and feed him to wolves or should they burn him? Well, eventually his house is on fire, so they just took Joe, threw his body back into his house. There goes the story of Joe Pizanthia. Vigilantes weren't done here in Bannock. While they left here, they went to Virginia City. They hanged five men simultaneously. They're going to go as far north as Missoula into the Bitterroot Deer Lodge Valleys, hang men at all these localities. Halloween night, 1864, they come back here. They hang a man by the name of R.C. Raleigh, nicknamed Pegleg man missing portions of both of his feet to frostbite. After his execution, a well-known Bannock resident named Amidi Bissett wrote, oh, simply an honest mistake. His name sounded like somebody else's. And that was the end of vigilantism in Bannock, Montana. Historical fact has become muddied by mythology and sensationalism. Like the sought-after gold dust, truth is difficult to sift from the dramatic retellings. Despite an assertion by the Montana State Historical Society that this photo is a hoax, it continues to be publicized as a likeness of Sheriff Henry Plummer. Even his remains have vanished. His shallow grave was looted. All that's left of him are the stories and three signatures. The hanging of Plummer and two of his deputies continues to be a spirited debate. The legend of his violent past persists. He was a man of mystery, both a gentleman and a rogue. Met Henry Plummer just before getting to Rattlesnake. He was on horseback. I told him about losing my robe and overcoat there a few days before, and he said he would try to find them for me. He is the sheriff of the country. He appears to be a very nice man. I like him very much. I remember Plummer very well. He was frequently in my cabin, and I often came in contact with him while he was exercising the office of sheriff. One might as well have looked into the eyes of the dead for some token of a human soul as to have sought it in the light gray orbs of Plummer. Their cold, glassy stare defied inquisition. They seemed to be gazing through you at some object beyond as though you were transparent. Plummer even aspired to be marshal of the territory and forwarded his application to Washington. His commission came in after he had been hung. discoveries of gold quickly left the execution of Plummer behind. The territory was growing rapidly. In the decade following John White's discovery of gold on the Grasshopper, 500 mining camps sprouted from the Montana wilderness. In 1864, Bannock was named the first capital of the new Montana Territory. The first legislature convened in a log cabin. The discovery of gold in Bannock is on July 28, 1862 and it is the first large gold strike in what is now Montana. Within a year, the population here swelled to 3,000, perhaps 6,000 up and down the gulch. So the men started spreading out. And in May 1863, they come upon one of the largest single placers in American history, the discovery of Alder Gulch, Virginia City, Nevada City, Montana area. And perhaps two thirds of the population of Bannock would follow them onto Virginia City even Bannock to be a town of about a thousand people. Bannock is never really a ghost town. People are always trying to make it here. Bannock had left its gold rush stage. We are entering a new stage of industrial gold mining. They're going to build ditches, there's going to be hydraulics, there's going to be dredge boats going on. Gold mining would continue for practical purposes until 1941 and the advent of the Second World War. We are very fortunate here to have oral histories from people living here in the teens, the 20s, the 30s, and they tell you a fabulous, rich history of what was going on in Bannock, perhaps a town of three or 400 at that point in time, how bootlegging goes rampant during days of prohibition, how prostitution went into the 1930s. There are great stories from all different periods of time. One miner mining out here in the 1960s gave us this fabulous story of 
three men on a cold night jumping into the same bed to stay warm. The one man rolls over, his head freezes to the window in the middle of the night. As he pulls it away, he loses a big patch of hair. While Bannock had left its gold rush, it was never a dead town. People were always trying to make it here, and there was a small population that actually lasted here into the mid-60s and mid-70s. Original buildings in the town site of Bannock were donated to the Beaverhead County Museum Association, and in 1954, the state of Montana took over management of the property. They turned it into a state park. The park has maintained the original buildings and artifacts. Guided tours, hiking, and an adjacent campground welcome visitors to relive the early days of the gold rush, the Medal of the Pioneers, and the adventure of a once lawless land. Every third weekend in July, when the park hosts Bannock Days, thousands of visitors throng the streets, bringing Montana's first town back to life.